My name's um, Dr. Sarah Myhill. I'm here speaking for um, Life, the Basic Manual. It's all about um, giving people the knowledge that they need to heal and cure themselves. I talk more about diet and food than all other subjects put together. And I now know without a shadow of a doubt, it doesn't matter what's wrong with you, and in fact, sometimes I have people who just come and see me because they want to live to their full potential. The starting point is diet. And until you get a diet, the, the right diet in place, um, nothing else is going to work half so well. Now, the bottom line is that human beings evolved over millions of years eating a paleo diet um, based on meat, fat, fish, nuts, seeds, and so on. The carbohydrate content of that diet was very low. Now, when I say that, people immediately come back to me and say, oh yes, but we found, you know, Paleo Man had got fruit in his stomach. We found Paleo Man actually was eating um, some grains, um, some pulses, some um, um, root vegetables. Yes, that is true, but he was only eating those foods for a limited window of time. So that's when autumn came along. Now, humans have a very unique metabolism. We, we have an engine that it's like it can run on petrol and it can run on diesel. It can run on two fuels. It can run on carbohydrates and starches and it can also run on fat and fiber. But the key point about Paleo Man is for the most of the months of the year, he was running on fat and fiber because he was a hunter. And it was only that brief window of time when the carbohydrates came into his diet. Now, Paleo Man learned to eat carbohydrates in an addictive way. Once he started eating them, he couldn't stop. So you have a, he had a mouthful of honey and he'd have more honey. He'd have a mouthful, he'd have a banana and he wouldn't be satisfied until the whole banana tree was gone. And the reason for that is because eating carbohydrates switches on metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome means we have high levels of insulin. High levels of insulin mean we lay all that sugar and carbohydrate down as fat. And fat is major survival, influence, survival benefit for the winter. Fat insulates us and keeps us warm, and it's also a personal pantry. Um, so when we starve in the winter, uh, we don't starve to death, we just burn our fat reserves. So fat has huge, carrying fat has huge survival value. Now, in the short term, metabolic syndrome is fine, it doesn't do us any harm at all, it allows us to survive winter. But the trouble is we now live in a time of permanent autumn. We can eat those foods throughout the year if we choose. You know, I can buy strawberries at Christmas from the supermarket. You know, I can eat bread all year round if I want to. And because carbohydrates are addictive, and they had to be addictive in order to make primitive man get fat in the autumn, if they weren't addictive, he'd, he'd have had some and left it. Left it. Um, so evolution made us carbohydrates addicts, if you like, for the survival value. But if we eat carbohydrates constantly, all day and throughout the year, we develop something called metabolic syndrome. And we now know that metabolic syndrome is the precursor to diabetes. And we now know that metabolic syndrome and diabetes are driving out epidemics of cancer, of heart disease and dementia. In fact, dementia has now been called a type three diabetes. It's a sugar disorder in the brain. Now, the mechanism of that hasn't quite been worked out, but um, sugar and carbohydrates are at the root of this. And in fact, there's a fascinating study done by Dale Bredesen, who's a neurologist from California, who took 10 patients with Alzheimer's disease and put them on a paleoketogenic diet, cut out all the carbohydrates. He also insisted that those um, patients ate all their food within a 10 hour window of time. So 14 hours of the day they were fasting. He reversed their Alzheimer's disease in nine of the patients. Four of them got back to work. Um, and having had quite advanced Alzheimer's, you know, having to be cared for, um, got lost, um, uh, appalling memory, of course, uh, they'd be effectively their brain function normalized. The one patient he failed with uh, couldn't stick to the regime. She didn't have the support package that was necessary to do that. Now, if this had been a drug that had achieved that result, that would have been headline news in every paper in the world. You know, this fantastic drug. It didn't. Why? Because a ketogenic diet is difficult. The reason it's difficult is because to get into a ketogenic diet, we have to give up carbohydrates. And giving up carbohydrates is difficult because it's an addiction.
It's the least well recognized addiction. In fact, I see people, they go through life through addiction. It starts off, you know, as a baby with, with milk and sugar and carbohydrates, and then they progress on to chocolate, and then they progress on to caffeine, and then alcohol and nicotine, and then um, um, uh, drugs, uh, ecstasy and, and intravenous um, drugs and heroin and so on. And they get to the peak of this addictive lad, if they like, and they suddenly realize, you know what, I've got to clean up my life. And they give up the alcohol the uh, heroin and then they give up the um, uh, cannabis and they give up the ecstasy and they give up the alcohol and they end up at the bottom which is the sugar carbohydrate addiction and because that is so socially acceptable because everybody does it they think that's okay they've arrived but believe you me they haven't and sugar and carbohydrate addiction is endemic in modern society and we do it because everybody else does it. Um, but everybody has metabolic syndrome and everybody is at risk of cancer and heart disease and dementia. And this all began with the big debate during the 1970s between Ansel Keys, who was an American PhD, and um, 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 Professor, his name will come to my head in a moment, um, um, who was a professor of nutrition at Queen Elizabeth College. And um, the professor said, essentially, we should be um, fueling our body with fat and fiber. Ansel Key said, no, it should be sugar and carbohydrates. And unfortunately, the sugar and carbohydrate um, um, body won. It was backed by the food industry, surprise, surprise. It was backed by the American army, surprise, surprise. It was backed by government, surprise, surprise. Because carbohydrates make money. If you want to make money, sell an addiction. Why? Because people get addicted to it. So we've now had 30, 40 years of metabolic syndrome, people fueling their body with um, uh, sugars and carbohydrates. And we now have epidemics of obesity, epidemics of um, diabetes, epidemics of cancer, heart disease, and dementia. It's very easy to diagnose metabolic syndrome. You just look in your supermarket trolley. And um, um, if that soup, that mark trolley, there's a great pile of, of fruit, and fruit is a bag of sugar, and cereals, and bread, and biscuits, and chocolate, and beer, that person's got metabolic syndrome. I know that the normal definition of metabolic syndrome is central obesity and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and all that. Don't wait until you've got those symptoms. Diagnose it now and do something about it. Now, the paleo ketogenic diet is difficult. Um, I've written a book about it. And um, first of all, I detail why we should be all eating that diet. Um, but what we have to do is we have to start off we start, if you think of this as a journey, we start off in the land of sugar and carbohydrates and we have to get to the land of uh, fat and fiber. And between the two is a boggy patch, which I call the metabolic hinterland. And you, we all have to wallow our way through that metabolic hinterland before we arrive in the land of fat and fiber. And that hinterland is characterized by you can't get fuel from carbohydrates because you're cutting them out of your diet. And you can't get fuel from fat because there's an inertia in the system. It takes some time to become keto adapted. So I reckon that journey takes a couple of weeks and I say to my patients, expect to get worse, expect to be more fatigued, more foggy brain, and any symptoms that you may have may get worse. But once you arrive, you will know you've got there and there are some clues to this. The first clue is that your teeth become glassy smooth. I don't know if you've ever been to the dentist and had your teeth polished, um, but they have a very smooth feel about them. Why? Because all the dental plaque, all the, um, uh, has been scrubbed off your teeth. Now plaque is biofilm behind which bacteria hide. And if those bacteria are hiding there, they're rotting your teeth and they're rotting your gums. So as soon as you eat a ketogenic diet, you're starving those bacteria and they die the plaque scrapes away, your teeth become glassy smooth. Uh, you will never get dental decay again, you will never get gum disease again, and whilst many old people expect to lose their teeth and have dentures, that won't happen. You will retain your teeth for life. So that's the first thing. Second sign is your tongue becomes clean. Many people, especially the carb addicts, find that if they scrape their tongue, they've always got a, a level of crud on there, um, um, which is bacterial colonies or yeast colonies. So um, uh, you should be able to scrape your tongue. Uh, your tongue should be pink with no debris, detritus, crud on the surface, as I call it. Gut symptoms, you have none. So anybody with bloating, wind, and of course bloating and gas and burping is a cardinal sign of fermenting gut. That should disappear. 
People tell me that their brain clears up, they are much sharper mentally. Why? Because you're eating sugar and carbohydrates, you're fermenting. If you're fermenting, you're producing alcohol, D-lactate, hydrogen sulfide, and all those things give you foggy brain and poison the brain. Very often people say their um, energy levels improve. Um, the athletes tell me their performance improves. In fact, Mike Morton, who currently holds the world record for distance running in 24 hours, he ran 172 miles in 24 hours. He's keto adapted. He fuels his body with, uh, with ketones. He's on a fat fiber diet. So athletic performance improved, disease symptoms resolve, arthritis disappears, um, foggy brain goes, fatigue lifts, and of course, this is the starting point to treat um, infections. Now, people ask me, okay, my own you all sound so bloody clever. You know, what do you do now? I, one of my philosophies is I never ask my patients to do something that I can't do or won't do. So um, about 18 months ago, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to get my head around this ketogenic diet. And um, on the back of that experience, I produced another book called The Paleo Ketogenic Cookbook. And yes, I went through the metabolic hinterland, but now I'm in the land of fat and fiber. And I feel very cocky and very smug being there because I know I'm sharper mentally and I know I have more energy physically. One of the joys is I only eat two meals a day. Um, and that saves me making lunch. So I don't have to think, what am I gonna have? I don't have to look in the fridge. I don't have to put anything on the table. I don't have to waste time eating it. I don't have to clear it away because I don't get hungry. So my breakfast is a good old fashioned fry up. So I have, and I'm very lucky, I've got my own pigs. So I have the best bacon in the world and the best sausage in the world. So I have bacon and sausage, and then um, I have eggs um, and whatever's in the garden. At the moment, it's green beans and onions. So that will be my breakfast. And then um, my evening meal, which I try to adhere to the Bredesen 10 hour window. So I have that evening meal, not too late, maybe half past six, seven o'clock in the evening, um, which again will be meat and green vegetables. Um, and then um, my pudding will be berries from the deep freeze. Of course, I'm very lucky. I've got my own garden with lots of berries with um, coconut milk on it. And coconut milk is very low in carbohydrate or rather coconut cream is very low in carbohydrate. And um, with that diet, as I say, I know I'm sharper mentally and I'm sharper physically and that's what I do. In the book though, there are lots of other suggestions um, um, for breakfast and, um, uh, and, for, and for main courses. But one of my triumphs in the book, I have to say I'm very proud about this, so um, forgive me for being a bit smug about it. One of the main reasons why people can't stick to the diet is because there's no bread there. All breads, even the gluten-free breads, are high carbohydrate. So I spent six months, and every um, um, day before breakfast, um, I experimented making loaves. Now, I have now put together a, a recipe that only has three ingredients. It has linseed. Now, linseed is a fantastic grain because it's very low carbohydrate. It's only 2% carb. Sunshine salt, and I talk about this in, uh, in another snapshot, um, which essentially it's a salt, which is 80% sea salt, but it's got all the minerals in there, um, about 12 different minerals, and um, vitamin D and vitamin uh, B12, um, and water. They're the only three ingredients. I can now make a loaf in about five minutes. Um, it takes five minutes to prepare, about an hour to cook. And it looks like a small hovis, it cuts like a small hovis, it tastes great, it toasts really well, and I make fried bread from that every morning. So, you know, I have fried bread with my bacon and eggs. Of course, you have to fry it in lard. It has to be fried in a saturated fat, not oil. Don't cook in oil because it flips it into a trans fat. So cooking in oil is bad news. Oils should be um, consumed raw, just drizzled on food. And I feel nourished by that, I feel sustained by that. Believe you me, I'm a greedy pig. I eat a lot, my weight stays exactly the same. And, and I'm now confident, okay, I might die falling off my horse, breaking my neck, and I've done that three times already, um, but I know I'm not gonna die of cancer or heart disease or dementia. And that's a very nice feeling because I have people my age, you know, who are developing Parkinson's disease, who are developing cancers, you know, I don't wanna go there. So it's partly fear driven, I have to say, but also, I say, I can't tell my patients what to do without me being immersed in it and knowing about it and being able to get that message across with the necessary enthusiasm to make them make the change. Because believe you me, it's difficult. But this is a diet we should all be doing for life, to live life to our full potential and to make sure we don't die of something nasty before our time is due.